Good afternoon for the folks that are at least still awake after lunch. Um, I'm Rim Cothran. I'm the technical director for the California Health Equality Program at the Institute for Population Health Improvement at UC Davis Health System. Um, the, uh, the CHECK program is the recipient of a uh, uh, large number of the funds under the Cooperative Agreement Program with ONC for Statewide Health Information Exchange through CHHS. And we're tasked with uh, implementing a large portion of the technology associated with the state strategy for health information exchange. It's difficult for me to talk about what it is that we're doing without at least setting some context because there, there are some constraints and there are drivers for what's going on uh, within the industry and within uh, government that really uh, impacts how we're approaching statewide health information exchange. Uh, not the least of which are the fact that there are a lot of federal programs going on right now, starting with the Nationwide Health Information Network. And that's important not just because ONC did it, but because if you want to exchange information with the DOD or the VA or SSA or CMS, you need to talk in him. I'm showing my age. That's, it will always be in him to me. I'm sorry. Um, there is, of course, the EHR incentive program and meaningful use. And that's not important only because there's a lot of money being spent there, but it is driving what EHR vendors are adding to their products today. And like it or not, we have to deal with that and find places where we can leverage it. And then there are a lot of other ONC initiatives going on. You've heard about two of the exemplar governance initiatives. There's direct that um, we've heard a great deal about today. There are standards efforts going on within the SNI framework still are happening. And these are things that we have to react to. In addition to that, ONC has said, thou shalt, and listed out what our priorities would be. And they are e-prescribing, uh, structured lab uh, delivery, uh, care summary exchange, and a few requirements around public health. And that's what we're to concentrate on. So everything that we do within uh, the statewide HIE program in some way is targeted at delivering these things. The trick is to do that in such a way that it actually still meets the needs of the, of the people that we're serving in California as well. Now, when ARA came along and infused a fair amount of money to the states to build statewide HIE, that came with um, uh, a, a need to develop a strategy. And most of the states in the country are building a monolithic health information exchange. And anybody that's paying attention to what's going on in California knows that we're not doing that here. And it's just not going to work here, just as it doesn't work in New York. And New York didn't follow that, that path as well. And in fact, most large states are not following a path like that. And that's because we have a very different ecosystem here that we have to deal with. In fact, if you take a look today, there are probably on the order of 30 organizations in varying stages of health information exchange maturity. Uh, about half of them are community not-for-profit organizations, and about half of them are enterprise organizations that exchange perhaps using EHR technology and perhaps using HIE technology. Anyway, there are a large number of organizations that are moving health information around within their communities or their enterprises today. So coming up with a good competition for these 30 successful organizations is something that also doesn't make sense. So I guess the question is, is so what do we do for a strategy? How does California try to um, address this, this, the, the, this uh, ecosystem that, that we're faced with here and still deliver on what the needs are for California? So the strategy is actually relatively straightforward. The first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we uh, provide support for the organizations that are already out there, already successfully doing exchange, and accelerate that to the extent that we can. We're promoting uniform standards. One of the mechanisms for that is being a member of the interoperability work group, where we're promoting standards to that organization. We have another uh, uh, effort within California we'll talk about in a minute. Um, there's a great deal that we're doing to put together a trust environment that enables organizations to exchange information with each other and across state lines. Um, it is not the same infrastructure that's built into the shiny, but it's the same type of approach. How do you knit these organizations together so that you don't just create different stovepipes around your HIEs? And then we're increasing the capacity of public health to receive information. Part of that, at least, um, to meet the needs of meaningful use 
but just as much to make sure that we actually address population health issues within the state of California. And so we'll talk about all of these. I'm going to leave uh, number three and four, the trust framework for last, because that's the one I want to spend a little bit more time on, because it really talks to some of the same issues that David and Anuj talked about in, in some of the governance activities. So first of all, expansion and acceleration. And we've probably used about half of the funding within uh, California for statewide HIE in these programs. And there's a lot of, a lot of initiatives that have uh, gone on and some that are still active today. So it starts with uh, uh, planning uh, support for emerging HIOs, and we've helped get some HIOs off the ground and move them forward through planning grants to help them uh, ready for new HIOs within their regions. We've um, supported organizations through the expansion of their infrastructure and their capabilities to reach out to organizations within their, their region or their capture, cap, capture area. Spent a great deal of um, uh, time and effort and funding on new interfaces for existing organizations so that they can more completely meet the needs of their customers and the organizations within their geographies that are providing, uh, producing health information. Um, we are about to launch a new program in the conversion of existing laboratories in the state, especially the high volume independent laboratories or hospital laboratories, to make sure that they take information orders in using LOINC and report results back out using SNOMED in compliance with meaningful use. One of the big absences in the uh, program uh, for the incentive program is that they're plow plowing a lot of uh, money into EHR vendors so that they can accept lab reports, but they're not doing anything to fund labs to make sure that they can provide those reports. So some of our money is going in that direction. Um, we have a couple of programs that are about to launch now uh, providing um, expanded analytics of clinical information within HIEs. It's some of the value add beyond just the exchange of health information. We are in the middle right now of making awards for a new interface program um, for uh, public health reporting. We'll talk about a little bit more. And then um, we are uh, in the early phases of a large program to provide uh, health information exchange services to rural parts of California that aren't necessarily well provided by a local or an enterprise um, HIE. If we turn to promoting standards, the news talked about what the EHR HIE interoperability work group is doing to promote standards. Um, what they're doing is um, uh, largely looking forward. Um, what we wanted to complement that with, though, is uh, a better understanding of what EHR, uh, what the EHR vendors in the EHR industry is making available to providers today. And the problem that we were trying to address here is that a lot of our providers are buying EHRs, not buying interoperability along with them because most providers aren't IT experts and don't know what their EHRs provide or how to even ask for interoperability. So we created a uniform set of, I won't call them requirements, but a list of the capabilities that we wanted EHR vendors to simply state, do you support these or not? Uh, in shipping products, don't tell me about your pipeline, don't tell me about your technology plan, but in shipping product, products today that are um, certified for meaningful use. And then we describe those in what looks like a buyer's guide. The guys that support uh, interoperability very well. And then tell me what it costs to buy interoperability. And I don't want the Chinese menu of all of the different types of interfaces that an IT expert might be able to determine that they need today and might need tomorrow and the year after that. What does it cost to buy interoperability? And we're continuing to promote this, this, this program. Uh, we're working closely with um, uh, Calypso uh, to, pro to promote this and um, uh, over the course of the summer revising it to better align with Meaningful Use Stage 2 um, and uh, we'll be launching that soon. Public health is the other area that is impacted by the incentive program but not the recipient of funding through the incentive program and that's that EHRs are expected to report um, uh, public health information in a particular standard without consideration for whether public health is ready to receive it that way. So one of the things that we're doing is helping public health ready for the onslaught of information that they've been starving for for so long. 
but in a manner that's compliant with meaningful use. So that the EHRs that are capable are certified to provide information in that way can actually send it. The big success that we've had there so far has really been addressing immunizations. That was our first place to go. And um, at the end of May, delivered to public health uh, uh, what we call the uh, Immunization Gateway Service, which has since been renamed by them as the Public Health uh, Portal as a way of receiving public health information, first immunizations. It's really three parts to it. First, it supports registration of physicians that are, or organizations that are going to be reporting, an automated validation service to make sure that you can go through testing, and yes, you really can submit information the way you're supposed to be able to, and then a gateway that takes that information in and then sends it to one of the appropriate one of seven different regional registries within the state of California that should be the repository for that information. And as I said, CDPH um, is planning to expand the capabilities of this gateway to meet the needs for public health reporting in some other areas as well, other registries um, such as uh, uh, lead, the cancer registry, etc. So I skipped over the trust thing there in the middle. And I really do want to come back to that because that's a lot of the effort that we've got moving on, moving forward right now, and interfaces a lot to uh, uh, the two talks that you just heard. I want to start off by talking a little bit about two organizations that we're working with very closely as part of all of this. And the first of those is the National Association for Trusted Exchange, or NATE. Um, People have heard me talk about the Western States Consortium for a long time. NATE is the new incarnation of that same organization. And it's a collection of states that's really concentrating on using direct to exchange PHI across state lines. And what are the special needs uh, associated with governing the exchange of PHI when you go across state lines and you deal with the different regulations and requirements of different states? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the successes uh, of Nate and some of the, the future programs here in a second. Uh, the other organization is KHIR, the California Association <coughs> for Health Information Exchanges. This is an organization that was convened uh, by Cal OHI in March of this year and is currently incorporating as a membership organization. It's really comprised of the major thought leaders and their organizations that do HIE, that do HIE in California today. It's a little over a dozen members right now, and that's, that's expanding. And they're charged with developing, really, what are the rules of good behavior, and how do you, how do you manage inter-HIO, or inter-organizational exchange within California? And although it does impact direct, it goes beyond direct. And one of the things in particular that KHI is interested in is understanding how the same standards that currently make up e-health exchange under Healthy Way can be used in California for organizations that have not yet onboarded into the national exchange. So I'm going to I'm, I'm going to posit that there are a couple of things, a few things that need to happen if you're really going to have trusted exchange. And there are just certain things that you need to know. First, you need to know that your conversation is not being overheard, heard, that it's really a secure conversation that you're having. Second, you need to understand who it is that you're talking to. Because if you're talking to the wrong person, then you're looking at a breach. Third, you need to understand who it is that you're talking about, that both of you agree on the patient the conversation is about. And fourth, that there has been consent for this a conversation, whether it's a conversation that's allowed under HIPAA or something that goes beyond that that the patient has consented to. And for now, because we're talking about state uh, statewide HIE, the context for that is not the conversations that happen within an HIO. Uh, the state's not interested, and Czech is not interested in getting the, in the middle of working um, HIE today. But how do we get between organizations in a scalable way without um, uh, the situation uh, that David described earlier with point-to-point uh, agreements between every one of them and all of the legal fees that go along with that. So let's first start with ensuring that you're not overheard. And what I'd like to do is step through each one of these and talk a little bit about what we're doing in California to address them. 
So first of all, um, part of what we're doing just to ensure um, that we've got good behavior of all of the organizations is um, uh, Cal OHI has been leading the development of a set of model modular participants agreements. It's essentially a set of legal documents that, that outline how an HIO interacts with its participants, the users of its services, and how it will behave with them. The idea here is that each HIO probably has a participant's agreement, but if they're largely the same or they follow the same model and share a lot of the same components, then that eases an understanding between organizations of how they might also trust each other and share information between each other. The second is a set of eligibility criteria for trusting other communities. And Nate develop, developed one of these um, uh, during the course of last year and set up a trust community based on the, that eligibility criteria for exchange between providers across state lines for treatment purposes. And it's, it's a relatively simple document that dictates what is good behavior of a HISP exchanging across state lines. And the third thing is through the activities of KHI, we're developing a multi-party party data sharing agreement that will dictate how organizations within California will behave, what dictates good behavior among those organizations. Unlike what Nate did, it's not limited to just direct exchange, but also covers um, uh, exchange using query response, uh, uh, the uh, uh, exchange specifications, and therefore draws a lot of its material from the DERSA. The second is a technical piece. How do, you, how do you ensure that things are not overheard? Well, we're developing trust communities. And I won't go into this in any great detail because David's talked to you a little bit about how trust communities work and how trust bundles work, but we're following that same model within California as well. So we're developing a set of trust anchors that identifies the organizations that have agreed to good behavior and bundling them together so those organizations can identify each other and know that they're trusted for exchange. I think the word was leverage before rather than steal, but you've seen this, this diagram. David already put it up today, and I don't know which one of us leveraged it on. <laughs> Who? I, don't, I know I didn't create it. I got it from somebody else. But anyway, the idea here is to make something that's scalable so that not everybody is putting together either technical um, exchange of digital certificates or uh, legal agreements with every other organization within California. And if you hearken back to the map that I showed you before, we're talking potentially about 30 organizations within California alone that would have to develop these agreements and exchange trust anchors in order to make things work. So we're replacing that with a trust bundle. In fact, if you take a look at Nate, Nate began distributing trust bundles um, in November of last year, continues to tr uh, exchange a trust bundle that defines the community, uh, the trust community for Nate participants, and we're going to be leveraging that same uh, mechanism um, uh, uh, within California as well. Now, I don't want uh, I put a bunch of uh, um, links throughout the presentation, and I know that this is going to be available to people. Don't go hit this one yet. Uh, Nate agreed to an update of the service uh, just literally two days ago, and it's scheduled for update over the weekend. So today, if you hit it, it'll look different than it will next week, but in addition to a legacy format that, that we've been using um, uh, since November, we're also making trust bundles available using the new ONC format um, and distribution mechanism um, that, that we participated in the development of. It's, a, it's the same mechanism that Direct Trust is, is using and therefore uh, allows us to, to, to leverage the same technology. So next. How do you know who you're talking to? And really this is about finding the right provider. And so what we're doing here is we uh, have developed a federated set of provider directories that allow you to discover the direct addresses and other mechanisms that you can use to exchange information with organizations in the state and with individuals in the state with whom you do not have uh, a relationship, unaffiliated organizations to you. And it's important to us that this be a federated provider directory. And we're not developing a single directory for the entire state. And we believe that that's important because it's really um, important to make sure that the data that is in the directory is managed by the organizations that 
have the relationships with the individuals that they're representing, and therefore we have some hope for that data being accurate. We've all had experience with national uh, uh, provider databases of information that are woefully incomplete or have erroneous data in them because there's no motivation to keep that data accurate. And here, if we, if we put the management in the hands of the people that have a responsibility to their customers, we have the hope of accurate information. So um, uh, we, we, we really believe strongly in this. We are we're developing it uh, using um, uh, the HPD standards um, as edited by the uh, change proposal that Anuj talked about. Um, so it conforms with, with HPD+. Plus. And if things go well, we'll be part of the, the demonstration that, uh, that uh, Anu spoke about earlier. Just to give it an idea of how this works within the, the framework of interstate exchange as well, we did a demonstration at HEMS earlier in the year um, of how uh, Oregon could place a query to California and get direct addresses from multiple uh, HIOs or multiple HISs within the state of, of California. This mechanism is in production for Nate today. It is operational, and we're going to be extending it to other organizations within California uh, here over the next several weeks. So what's also interesting is when you're talking to people, there are cases where you may not be talking to a provider, but you may be talking to a consumer or a patient. And David also talked about, well, there might be PHRs that um, are compliant with direct and be doing direct messaging. One of the interesting things that we'll be looking at is we just kicked off a project through Nate to start looking at how you establish trust with PHRs. And there, here we're talking about a very different environment and we're going to be looking at bi-directional exchange, not just the exchange from a provider to a patient, but the exchange between a patient and a provider. And if you think about the, the problems and the issues that you'll come up with with provisioning individual consumers or patients, ensuring that you're talking to the people you really think you're talking to, it's going to be an interesting problem to, to, to solve and we're really looking forward to that project. So what's next? That's kind of looking back at what we've done over the last several months. So what's next? I think the thing that I'm probably the most excited about, but probably also the most ner nervous about, um, I'm telling people this morning I didn't sleep well last night. I, I don't sleep well at all anymore, um, <laughs> is a pilot that we're in the process of starting up now. And it's going to be informing the technologies that we use in California and the policies and practices um, that will be developed by HAYHI for governance of, inter, uh, of intrastate or inter-HIO exchange within California. We've currently got six participants in the pilot. We're expecting two more. Um, that, uh, and I've listed the ones that are already in the pilot now. It's Inland Empire. Um, Ocprio, Rain, it's a, a telemedicine uh, organization uh, along the, the central coast that folks may not be uh, familiar with. Santa Cruz HIE, um, uh, Walter's company is doing a pilot down in Southern California and has done some real piloting work in implementing HPD+. And then UC Davis Health System, not my organization but my, pa my parent organization, that is actually using an EPIC implementation, uh, an EHR implementation to, to do direct and exchange. And we're going to be testing uh, uh, the trust framework, developing trust bundles for direct and for exchange. We've got, uh, of the organizations that have uh, agreed to participate in the pilot, five of them will be, um, uh, five of them currently operate direct. Of those five, two of them are community HIOs, one of them is an enterprise HIO, and two of them are independent HISP uh, service providers. And as I said, we're expecting to add two more in the coming week or two. And then four are operating exchange, three of those four having onboarded onto Healthy Way already. So one of the interesting complications of what we're doing here is to really test some of the things that David talked about. Can we work alongside of uh, Nate, which is dealing with interstate exchange, and with Direct Trust, which is doing accreditation, to make sure that our organizations can also exchange with each other and continue to exchange with the other accredited organizations through Direct Trust 
or the other uh, organizations um, that are onboarded through NAIC. And likewise, we're going, we have organizations that have onboarded a healthy way and we need to ensure that we don't break their capabilities to continue to exchange with other healthy way onboarded organizations, but allow them to exchange with organizations that have not yet or have chosen not to onboard to healthy way. It's going to be a very interesting pilot. Um, we're in the process now defining eligibility criteria on onboarding uh, organizations. We have not yet closed applications for participation, uh, but we're going to end up having to do that soon as we're about to expend the, uh, the funds for that. And you can find out um, uh, how information, uh, a lot of information about that on the project wiki, and that'll change over time, so I recommend that people go back and visit often. And make sure that you tell us things that you think that we're doing wrong, things that we're le leaving out, etc. because we're really using this pilot as a way to inform our way forward. So there are some things that are part of trust that I haven't talked about yet, and I really want to leave you with some questions, some questions that we still have in our minds, and I think that we're looking for the community to help us answer. First of all, if we go back to who are you talking to, we've talked about how you locate mechanisms to talk with individuals, but right now we're either trusting that those individuals have been provisioned appropriately by their organizations or they've been accredited to do so, but there is no uh, shared identity management system that we all do that validates their identity in real time. <coughs> Our assertions of identity, are they really good enough? I, on a regular basis, have three vendors come to me and say, you know, I can get you shared identity management for everybody in California. Is that something that's useful to us? Is that something that we need? Second, we haven't talked at all about who are you talking about? Patient matching. Um, and there are a lot of organizations that are working on that companies that are well-funded. Healthy Way has identified it as one of its top priorities to continue working on. And at this point, we're watching what the industry is doing rather than weighing in. Is that the right approach? Is there something that we need to be doing in California specifically to address patient matching? Because information about the wrong patient is worse than no information at all. Or is it sufficient to, to let the industry work on this? And just at the chances of being a heretic, should we visit, once again, voluntary uh, uh, identifiers? And is there a role to play? Especially, uh, Mike talked this morning a little bit about the health information home. When you're talking about well-motivated patients that have a special condition and are in the mood to share information, is there a voluntary way of them identifying themselves that would be beneficial? Even if a, 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 a small fraction of the population in California volunteered for something like that, we might take um, some of the risk and some of the cost out of patient matching. And finally, something that we really haven't worked on at all yet is, um, uh, is there consent for the uh, conversation? And obviously, um, there's, there are certain circumstances under which consent is not necessarily necessary. However, there are other uses of health information that are of great interest to HIOs, to the state, and quite frankly, to patients as well. And so is there some way to, to manage that? And one of the disenfranchised organizations, uh, uh, communities within the HIE uh, space altogether is what you do about uh, behavioral health information that has special consent requirements that simply are not met by most HIOs. Is there something that we should be doing there? And I think we're going to be talking p at least potentially about that later on in the session today. So that's all I had. Um, I, I, it's, it's easy to leave other people with questions. We'll now open up questions for the, from the audience. The question is, in the HI certified seals, we've got certified community, certified direct. Um, my question is, in the the traffic that Redwood MedNet handles right now, um, none of it is query response. None of it is, effectively, none of it is direct. It's legacy push HL7 v2. Is that covered under the community seal? It's not. OK. It, it, um, Can we like discuss the quantity of traffic that currently 
rules and the certification, the certification process that's being stood up. And the yeah, actually, if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see exactly what's included in HI certified community. HI certified community is, is the PICS PDQ XTSB um, profiles for okay. IHE. Um, you know, if we look at HIEs, I mean, that's where we want to get to, fully integrate into the MRs from a physician practice query in the HIE. So, so that's what we're trying to get to. Okay, but my question is, neither of these certification badges affect current legacy traffic, right? Okay. Yeah. All right, now I want to spin it around and... Um, I want to ask Rim a question. I know it's next. <laughs> so, Rim, I'm. You you know what what what's coming. Um, <laughs> see, how do I get this up here? If any luck, you won't be able to find the slide. <laughs> That it was um, in your um, pilots. Yeah. All right. Again, is it? We've got healthy way onboarded organizations that do fixed PDQ, right? uh, station discovery. Document query, document retrieve. We've got entities that are going, going to be doing what I'll call classic direct, direct mess, direct messaging, the kind that David is talking about. Mm -hmm. um, do we also have unsolicited push? So, um, not right now, and and it, you know the the conversations that we've had within within K High have been uh, looking at, um, have concentrated on using direct and exchange specifications for inter-HIO exchange. The pilot is currently concentrating on only the query response mechanism under exchange. And the reason for that is, one, because the pilot is too complicated already. So it just scares the crap out of me to take on another one. But the truth is, is that Although, and, and I do know that this is coming because you and I have talked about it. I think that there is a great deal of utility in document submission, the push mechanism through exchange. There's a huge amount of utility in that. However, the organizations that are interested in participating in the pilot hadn't implemented it, that yet. So I think that is absolutely coming. I think it's going to be part of KHI. I think it's going to be part of the K. I, I hope that it's going to be part of KHI by the end of the year. And if we get a couple of organizations that want to try it out during the, the course of the pilot, I'm all game to do it. Because I do think it's an, an and you, important pilot. Uh, you realize that Redwood Manet is trying to find somebody who will. I know. So that's a call for volunteers that anybody that wants other to do. other party. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, a absolutely. I think that that's an important, uh, an important pattern that needs to be supported as okay. well. OK. Great. Um, Clem. Well, and let me start with following up on your question because what I think I heard was that where all the data is piled up in HIE, I mean, health uh, version two messages being sent all around different places. We could, in Indiana, we go to every hospital and get messages from them like that. You're not doing it or even tr even setting up to do no, it? No, absolutely. So you so are doing it. What, what we're doing is we're concentrating on the boundaries between HIOs, not between an HIO and the hospital or the practices, the clinics, et cetera, that they support. That is something, Will does that very well, Bill does that very well, not getting in the middle of that and not trying to govern that. That is, that is something that they've got worked out on their own, based on their own technologies, and don't want to get in the middle of that. All we're doing is looking at exchange between organizations that don't have any other relationship. And those organizations, in most cases, will be community HIOs or enterprise HIOs. Okay. So it's a very special use case there. Okay, well, and actually, there we're, we're relying on the, the standards that ONC is promoting. Well, keep listening to Will. That's all I can say. But I, I, oh, I, I, I do. He would not okay. let me not But I, I actually had some of my own questions. So one of them is it sounds like in some of these models, um, 
you can run into the same problem as fish ponds, especially the first, the first one. If everybody can connect to everybody, the, that's why fish ponds, you know, they don't connect them all because if you get one fish pond infected, they all get infected. And when you have, you know, a state or something like that, it's all sort of comfortable. But when the whole nation is connected in one fish pond, I thought that was the advantage of HIEs, that you don't have them all connected. Do you have a, a response to that? Or maybe you don't care about fish ponds. <laughs> well, my response to that would be we already have uh, fish ponds, um, big ones, um, and they're expensive. Um, the, the amount of money spent on mail communication uh, for simple requests for documents is enormous for state and federal agencies. Faxes and e-faxes are not only insecure, but they're very expensive to operate. So in many ways, direct is a way to replace those inefficient fish ponds with something that's a lot more efficient and more familiar and easier to use. Okay, I have one other question for, uh, for uh, California. You mentioned LOINC for orders and SNOMED for results. I, do you really mean that, or do you mean <laughs> LOINC for the tests that are results and SNOMED for the answers that are results? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And then the last one was, there's some exciting stuff about maybe you're going to do radiology and then actually send that around. That's, that's needed. Is that really going to happen? You had it on your slide. We, th some, of the, some of the interface grants that we put out are absolutely to connect up radiology clinics. Now, in that case, it's usually looking at just uh, radiology reports and not at, at imaging. But yes, moving that information as well. Okay, thanks. And we've had some, some of the organizations in the room here have been the recipients of some of those grants. Good. Well, by, the, by the way, this is very exciting. You see so much going on for something that I think a lot of it started in Indiana, where I'm from originally, and Mark's from originally, <laughs> or still from. You know. We're still catching up. Um, Walter. Thank you. Um, my question is about directtrust.org, uh, addressed to, uh, to Dr. Kibbe. And I don't know if, there, if, we, if it's possible to bring up one of his slides uh, relatively easily. It's the one about um, the, the sample trust infrastructure with the various organizations and HISPs and so forth. And my question has to do with, um, yeah, that's it, uh, has to do with, uh, I, I like your term, arc of liability. And it has to do with liability and, and some thoughts that, that uh, we've been given given to that and how directtrust.org may fit in. Um, first of all, actually I meant to say that uh, I wanted to commend Direct Trust on the, the certificate policy document that, that it's come out with for uh, secure uh, direct messaging and, and for anyone who hasn't read it, even if you're not you know, a security geek, um, it's well worthwhile going through to, because it's got a lot of great best practices for security uh, related to direct messaging. My question regarding liability, though, is um, essentially in this model, who is liable when something goes wrong? Um, so, for example, provider A, community A, receives a request from provider B and community B for some patient information. They They've been told by their HISP that if, they, if the message went through, then it can, it's from a trusted source. Um, and, and the HISP believes that to be the case because the HISP, HISP A believes that to be the case because HISP B was accredited by directtrust.org. Now something goes wrong and a, a, an unauthorized person uh, uh, impersonating provider B has actually made that request. Where, where do you think the liability lies is, is are there any rules or precedents around that um, or is it just going to be come down to case law uh, when when provider uh, a gets sued where the liability will fall because because provider a could say well I trusted his bay and his bay could say well I trusted direct trust to certify them and, and direct trust can say well I trusted his B and his B because I trusted the, my provider Where's, yeah, it, where's the buck going to stop? Yeah, that's a great question because the thing that you're pointing out here is that the bar has to be set high enough in terms of security and trust and identity controls that the, whatever process is used, whether it's accreditation or a contract, that is really meaningful, right? Because the, the, the worst thing that could happen over the next couple of years is that um, a major breach could occur with respect to the exchange of direct uh, messages. And the public and the docs would lose their, com completely lose their confidence in this way of uh, messaging. And um, so that's what keeps me up at night. Uh, because you know, we, we have people who want to do uh, really silly things 
um, as HISPs um, and come to us and say, won't you, why don't you allow us to do these really silly things? I mean, wh why does the community not want that? But to answer your question, um, in that model, um, the endpoints, the subscribers, the providers, the doctors or nurses or administrators who are using direct are all working in covered entities. So they're all obligated under HIPAA to abide by the security and privacy rules. The, the HISPs are all business associates. To be accredited on, with Direct Trust's uh, accreditation program, you must be sign a BAA with your subscribers. So um, the liability would be shared among those different parties. Um, and uh, you know, there's no way to answer that question any more thoroughly with that set of technologies for um, exchange than with fax or with mail but, or with but will, courier. Will, is directtrust.org also going to be sharing in the liability as part of its accreditation? Because HISP A knows nothing about HISP B except that it was certified by, accredited by directtrust.org. If, if direct trusts policies and best practice guidances were found to be inadequate or substandard and that that led to the, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm, I'm, I'm just suggesting why we have gone the lengths we've gone to create a certificate policy, um, as you say, which I think is very good and we're on our next uh, version, 1.3 is gonna be coming out in a couple of months. It's why we've created a HISP, we're in the process of creating a HISP policy document that spells out those and taking enormous amount of deliberate time to, to get it right. Um, I, I guess if we were delinquent, our membership were delinquent in publishing those policies, um, if we were delinquent in aligning them with federal regulations, which, is coming, which are coming down the road, then we would have to share in some of that. I don't think we are. I, I think we're, we're the membership of Direct Trust now working in concert with ONC is doing a really good job of making sure that that bar is adequately high. Um, it's not high enough for the federal agencies yet. I want to point that out. You know? So for exchange with federal agencies, they want even a higher bar with respect to identity verification. Um, but um, I think we're trying to be the Goldilocks uh, 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 and try to get this right. It's a really good question. The, the, po the main point, however, that you're bringing up, and I'm glad you did, is there really is real risk and real liability in this. And if it's not done correctly, somebody is going to get sued. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bill? <clears throat> My questions are about the uh, business uh, HISP is in and the, the costs and the relationships that those HISPs need to uh, do to be a HISP and to be exchanging data. And uh, I think about this in the cost in terms of cost to the HISP, which ultimately would have to flow down to its participants, customers, as well as just the complexity. So uh, I got to just tell you, my head's spinning a little bit. So I've got some specific questions. What is the cost to join direct trust? What's the cost to a HISP to get ENAC certified? Um, is Nate, uh, if you're certified and accredited with direct trust, are you automatically certified with Nate? Is there any sort of reciprocity? Uh, do, do we who aspire to be, you know, real HISPs here um, and really serving many customers need to go through accreditation uh, and application process with all these organizations? And then the uh, last thought on that is where does HealthyWay come in? Healthy Way's got its own onboarding application process fee structure, uh, accreditation or certification with CCHIT. Um, let, help, let me help take us out let here. me take a couple of the, well, those and then I'll pass the baton because I can't answer for Healthy Way or, or other or what what Nate would do or what not. Um, we're delighted that Nate is a member of Direct Trust. Um, Direct Trust fees as a nonprofit scale. So um, they, they go from $500 a year to $10,000, a year if you're a very large corporation. So the average, uh, uh, probably the average yearly due for a health information exchange is $500. So it's very reasonable. The accreditation costs are also um, very reasonable and they're also scaled. And um, a quick calculation is that um, the cost of accreditation is probably less than the maintenance, 
the establishment and maintenance are two or three contracts that the HISPs would have to sign with each other if they were doing one-off contracts. The whole point of direct trust was to create a single accreditation entity that would be national that would avoid HISPs having to do multiple state or regional accreditation programs, which is what was happening a year ago. I mean, if you were a HISP in, in California, but then you wanted to exchange information with a HISP uh, a subscriber in New York, right? And those two states had different accreditation programs. You'd have to pay doubly to go through the second accreditation program. And then if you wanted to went, went to Massachusetts, you might have to do another one. So the, the idea here is to, is to create, if we can, a single national uh, a point of accreditation, keep those prices as low as possible. ENAC is a nonprofit as well. Um, and then to collaborate with uh, as many parties as we can to weave the direct trust piece of this, which is, um, as you know, not everything an HIO or HIE has to think about into the fabric of trust for uh, California, for Massachusetts, for Texas, and so forth. The other questions I'm not sure I can answer because I think that, as you can tell, the, 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 the jury's not in, but I'll let Rim Well, and, and I think that that really is the answer. The jury isn't in yet. So I, I can tell you what Nate requires today, but I can't tell you what Nate will require tomorrow. <coughs> the eligibility criteria to be onboarded into Nate for interstate exchange was developed before uh, a direct trust accreditation was available. So it was developed as a standalone set of uh, criteria. Uh, you know, to be honest with you, I don't think that any of us have a desire to stand up a bunch of competing accrediting organizations and businesses. So I think that one of the things that needs to be considered, and for KHI as well, but for, for Nate is what role does direct trust accreditation play in the Nate trust community? And I don't know the answer to that. Today, yes, there is a separate, separate application. Um, is it as uh, costly and rigorous an accreditation as Direct Trust is doing? No, it isn't, and therefore there's probably some value in, in Direct Trust, and we'll just, we'll, that, that is something that still needs to be seen, but I think that the, I think the conversation here is really healthy for all of the reasons that Walter brought up, that this is important, that we're trying to get multi-party so, some multi-party mechanism for, of trust among organizations in, in lieu of a point-to-point -point con contract, it's a complicated set of requirements there that we're still working our way through. Uh, the Healthy Way one's easy. Uh, healthy Way doesn't do direct yet. And th there's still some discussion there about whether Healthy Way has any interest in doing direct. Um, and so uh, that one just doesn't play yet. I, you know, there, and there is healthy discussion. But it, it's, it's just not there. And, and we're in discussion with Healthy Way and, and working on a memorandum of understanding to at least uh, uh, make clear what the differences are between what Healthy Way does and what Direct Trust does. I mean, it's, the, it's in the interest of the industry that, that, uh, that, that there's an understanding that these are very different uh, uh, organizations with very different constituencies with some overlap and doing different stuff. 